an Orbiting Human Circus special, the second imaginary symphony. We are so grateful to HelloFresh.com for helping us share the second imaginary symphony with you. Receive $30 off your first week of deliveries when you go to HelloFresh.com and use the offer code OHC30. That's HelloFresh.com and the code OHC30. And check out OrbitingHumanCircus.com slash shop for two limited edition Second Imaginary Symphony t-shirts that are only available through July 6th. And now, our special bonus episode, episode 5. Hello everybody, um, this is Julian Coster, and welcome to this bonus episode. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do in it. Uh, first, I'm going to answer your questions that you guys sent in, uh, and then we're going to play the second imaginary symphony in its entirety without interruption in the exact form uh, that it was originally recorded and originally meant to be listened to. And there won't be any interruptions, so uh, you can just listen to it anytime you want to and um, have it in its complete form also. So that's what this bonus episode is. Um, and before we start, I, I really, I just wanted to say it, it's so, so uh, inspiring um, to begin working on our, our big season two, um, knowing that you're all out there and, and knowing that you're waiting. I'm going to start with the questions that um, don't have to do with the Second Imaginary Symphony and, and that are more about the Orbiting Human Circus. I'm just going to answer a few of those. One person asked me um, what I love most about podcasting or, or uh, podcasting, you know, using podcasting as an artistic or a creative medium. Um, and I have to say it's, it's, it's you. It's, it's, um, there's just nothing between us. And, 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 and it's amazing because in, in almost every artistic medium and, and, and since the history of mankind, there's been all of these barriers Podcasting, I think, is amazing because it doesn't have any. Um, a lot of people asked for advice about starting to play the saw. And um, things to know off the bat is that every saw has its own voice, which is, is one of the great miracles. Um, you know, so you can find saws in garage sales, hardware stores, anywhere, and they all have their unique range and their unique voice. If you buy a modern hardware saw, be really respectful of the blade. Be careful. Um, after you've handled it for a while, you might start getting kind of overconfident. I know I am. And uh, they can bite uh, if handled improperly or roughly. So just be aware. Uh, don't do that. Um, when you're just starting out, sometimes it's good to start out with a saw that's meant to be, that was made to be played. Um, and I don't like the ones without teeth personally. No offense if you play one without teeth. I mean, I think all saws are wonderful. I'm just saying myself, I, I do like saws with teeth. Uh, but um, so there are some folks named Musel and Westfall who um, have always made really wonderful tenor saws, well, all kinds of saws. But I think the thing is when you get a saw that you meet, you never know how many octaves it is. And if you don't, if you're just learning how to encourage a saw to sing, you might not um, realize that it's the saw that has a limited range and not you as an encourager. So I'll go on to the next question. Okay, um, I'm a lot of the questions that people asked about the Orbiting Human Circus, uh, a lot of those questions are going to be answered in season two and I think it'll be a lot more fun. So if your question isn't answered, I uh, know that it probably will be. Um, but one question um, that I think I can answer is someone asked how the janitor deals with the crippling cold at the top of the Eiffel Tower, um, especially in the winter, um, just living in a closet, in a janitor's closet. And uh, they did, the Eiffel Tower um, did install a wood-burning stove for the janitor, uh, which he uses, sometimes successfully, sometimes um, unsuccessfully. Um, Coco and other people help him. Um, another question that a lot of you asked about season two um, is if there's going to be, uh, well, basically romance. Um, I think you'll be happy. Okay, so before I start talking about the Second Imaginary Symphony itself, um, there is a bunch of questions about Platypus Eve. 
Um, and some folks asked about when Platypus Eve is or what time of year it is. And then one person asked a question that I think will let me answer it, that, those other questions most accurately. And, and this question was, is that every um, major holiday um, is rooted in, a, in an emotional core. Uh, they, they said Christmas is generosity, Thanksgiving uh, is familial bonding, Halloween is fear, and New Year's is hope. Uh, what is the emotional core of Platypus Eve? And I think that the emotional core of Platypus Eve is actually the stoppage of time. There are moments uh, in, you know, in all of our, all of our lives that we all know so well, where you just feel like time stopped. And if you think about it, that's often the best moments, all of the best moments. And I think what's interesting about that is that those moments have so little to do with time. Like the things that we're usually enjoying or feeling in those moments exist out of time. They they're timeless. They, they're they just always there. Um, and they always will be. Now the, the stuff um, framing the Second Imaginary Symphony, listening to in, in our series just now, uh, was very much about how people listen to it in Paris. But of course it's celebrated all over the world. And, you know, there are slight differences about how and when it's celebrated in, in different parts of France and, of course, in different parts of the world and in different parts of your imagination and in different rooms in your house and in different months of your years and in different parts of your life. And so that's why only uh, I think you can answer that question. And I hope that you do. One question that I, I just remembered that one person asked um, is about the great recitating platypus, whether the great recitating platypus recites his own poems or other people's poems. He does recite his own poems. And um, again, you might very well get to hear him uh, do so and get to hear a couple of his poems in season two. We'll see. Um, okay, so now I think it's time to start telling you guys the Second Imaginary Symphony uh, for cloud making was actually recorded a long, 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 long time ago, way, way before uh, the orbiting human circus of the air. Um, at the time, there was no such thing as podcasting. Um, as a matter of fact, there was no such thing as a pod <laughs> um, yet. But I had the idea, and this is someone's question as well. I had the the idea first, I think, when um, I was on tour with uh, one of the bands that I played in, and I had found this cassette in a, a thrift store. We used to go to a lot of thrift stores, always, I still do. Um, and I had found this cassette that was some sort of educational cassette that used to be used in school rooms, and I, I think it was quite, quite old. Um, and and, and um, I put on the cassette, uh, into our cassette player, and it actually started sort of the way the Second Imaginary Symphony starts. It's it was saying, you know, this is the Milkman, and then it would play a sound of the Milkman, and it would be it was sort of a little guide to a neighborhood, I think, for very young children. And um, I just started imagining what would happen if the cassette just went on and started telling this very strange story. And so that's kind of how it started. Um, and I thought immediately of Brian Duan, um, who is the narrator. Well, he does all the voices <laughs> on the Second Imaginary Symphony. And he also does a lot of voices on the Orbiting Human Circus. Um, you'll recognize his voice if you listen closely a little bit, or maybe you won't, because uh, he's such, so good at doing voices. But he um, he's on season one, and Hopefully he'll be a part, a big part of season two. 
Um, and but Brian has been a hero of mine. He was first. He was just a hero of mine. I, I became aware of Brian because of uh, he's an he's a wonderful artist. He builds these. Uh, in I, when I first became aware of him, he was building these incredible uh, New Year's monuments. Uh, one of them, these sculptural things. Uh, one of them was on the cover of the They Might Be Giants album Lincoln. Uh, if you ever want to see, uh, you know, any examples of these things he made, he made a lot of them. And usually they dispensed uh, champagne, too, from some part of them. So he would unveil them on New Year's Eve and they all have a clock on them. Uh, and they would dispense uh, champagne for a New Year's Eve party. Brian also made uh, amazing records. And he also later began building, you should look up Duanatron. There are these wonderful, wonderful electronic instruments. Uh, that he imagined and and uh, built with his cousin, and um, Brian Brian uh, just is is I honestly think he's one of the great artists of our time. If he hears this, he's probably going to get embarrassed, but I do feel that way. So I'm going to say it to all of you. Um, and anyway, I had met Brian a few times, we had sort of become friends, um, and I just asked him if he'd be willing to do this, and he said yes, um, because he's a very kind and generous uh, man, and he, um, he came out to visit me, I met him at my grandmother's house in Queens, and uh, well, New Hyde Park, which is at the Queens-Nassau border on Long Island, and that house it was a very magical place for me. And I, I'm mentioning all of this now because, um, you know, in a lot of ways, I've come to realize over time that, you know, Nye is, was sort of a little bit like childhood me. Um, I didn't realize it when I was making the record. Um, and the grandmother's house that's mentioned in it and the, the neighborhood and things are very much my grandmother's house and my grandmother's neighborhood when I was imagining them. And, uh, and that place, I, I'm sure I'll end up telling you guys all more about that place in the future. I, I, I can't, I couldn't begin now. Uh, but it is such a magical place. And, and, and my, my grandmother was such a magical woman. And, um, mm. and so it, it was really special anyway, that Brian uh, came out to meet me um, at my grandmother's and visit uh, when I was staying there and I gave him the script that I'd made of it which was incredibly rife with uh, misspellings which made him laugh very much. He has a very wonderful, very loud laugh. Um, and he took it and, um, and, and, and recorded that incredible performance uh, for me. Um, and I just, I just think that his performance on this is, is one of the most special things. And one thing that's kind of funny or interesting that many people have asked about also is whether Nye has anything to do with um, my bandmate uh, in one of the bands that I was in called uh, Neutral Milk Hotel, Jeff Mangum, uh, whose middle name is Nye. Um, and so um, his name uh, did come from Jeff, actually, because Jeff and I lived in a house together with uh, Robbie from the Orbiting Human Circus and the Music Tapes and Laura Carter, uh, who's also in New Triple Hotel and, and, and a million other things uh, that were so wonderful and important. Um, and and uh, we, um, on the kitchen one day, I went in there and there was a letter for Jeff, um, some sort of official letter, and it had his middle name on it, and I never knew his middle name. And I just couldn't believe, I'd never heard of the name Nye before. And I just loved it. Um, and of course, his, his middle name is Nye, N-Y-E. Um, the character in the story, his middle name is actually N-I-G-H. Because I guess what I loved so much about it was the idea that there could be a, a boy's name or a name uh, for a child that is Nye, um, meaning now, here, and, and um, arriving. <laughs> And I just thought that was kind of a wonderful name. Um, and I, I thought, and I just knew it was the name of this character. So the character is definitely Jeff's namesake. But I, I realize, obviously, because of my grandmother's house and because of that neighborhood and, and other things about Nye, that it, it almost feels like Nye, Nye is sort of like a, a, a childhood version of myself. And also, um, honestly, when I listen to Mr. Ackerman, he, he also sounds like you know, maybe another version. And now, 
um, I think the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to play it. So it's going to play in its entirety um, as it was originally conceived in one piece. And, you know, of course, in the future, you know, we, um, I did this because I wanted you to be able to just listen it to it whenever you want to. And, and you can, of course, just fast forward to uh, the time when the symphony starts, you know, in the future. But you'll have the whole thing um, to listen to how you want. Um, so, uh, thank you for being there, and um, we're going to just thank our sponsors um, one last time, and, um, and then the symphony is going to start, and there won't be any more introductions, and there'll be nothing following it, so you'll just have the second imaginary symphony. Um, thanks, everyone. This very special episode of the Second Imaginary Symphony is brought to you by HelloFresh, the meal kit delivery service that makes cooking more fun so you can focus on the whole experience, not just the final plate. Each week, HelloFresh creates new delicious recipes with step-by-step -step illustrated instructions. And the recipes are super easy so anyone can make a delicious, nutritious home-cooked meal in 30 minutes, even if you're not so comfortable in the kitchen. HelloFresh is offering you $30 off your first week of deliveries when you go to HelloFresh.com and use the offer code OHC30. I love the meals HelloFresh sent to me. I recently made succotash and fresh herb dressing made of mint and chives and lemon and olive oil, and I can't wait to make it again. So if you'd like to make meals like this one, go to HelloFresh.com and use the code OHC30 to get $30 off your first week of deliveries. The Second Imaginary Symphony is written, directed, and audio produced by Julian Coster, performed by Brian Dewan, and produced for podcasting by Christy Gressman. For more information, go to orbitinghumancircus.com or search for us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. The Orbiting Human Circus is part of Night Vale Presents. To learn more, go to nightvalepresents.com. And now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the Second Imaginary Symphony. This is Nye's Neighborhood. Just over that hill, factories, soon to be full of busy grown-ups hard at work. And this is Nye Street, Telegraph Road. There's the milkman. Every morning, he delivers a full day supply of dairy products to all the houses on Nye Street. And this big white house? This is Nye's house. And this is Nye. He's running down the stairs, though his grandmother has told him not to. Ordinarily, it would now be time for Nye to go to school. But since it's vacation time, Nye is free to stay at home with his grandmother and play. Nye's grandmother is blind and sometimes needs his help with household chores, such as sweeping. Doing wash. Taking out the garbage. And making trips to the supermarket. Walking home from the supermarket, Nye hears the distant song of the fire siren. The fire siren sits perched high atop its red brick engine house, luring firemen away from their families and homes.
It is now the dinner hour. Time for the turning sound of latch keys to echo throughout the land as grown-ups arrive home from work. Some arrive by automobile. Some arrive by bicycle. And others on foot. This is Mr. Ackerman, Nye's neighbor and friend. Mr. Ackerman works at the big factory just over the hill. Nye always looks forward to seeing Mr. Ackerman. You see, some time ago, Mr. Ackerman confided in Nye, a matter of great importance. Nye had begun to wonder just what it was that the big factory over the hill was making. Having whiled away many a twilight, admiring the great factory, Nye had come to know each of its towering smokestacks and flashing lights. But as for what it was that the great factory made, of this, even his grandmother was not quite sure. When asked at first, Mr. Ackerman did not answer. He regarded Nye silently, and after a long pause, said only, Nothing of interest, Nye. Nothing of interest. And continued on his way. This, however, served only to pique the nine-year-old's curiosity. And upon arriving home, Mr. Ackerman found the little boy still following close behind him. I promise you, Nye, what goes on inside the walls of that factory is of no interest to little boys, or anyone else for that matter. Now, please, Nye, I've had a long day, and I'm tired. And with that, Mr. Ackerman waved goodbye and disappeared into his house, closing the door firmly behind him. There was nothing for Nye to do but to stare for a moment at the closed door before him and walk silently away. Mr. Ackerman had never spoken so coldly to him before, and Nye was unsure of how to react. He did, however, know one thing for sure. Mr. Ackerman was not in the least bit interested in discussing what he did all day at that factory. Why, he wondered. Nye thought about the sorts of things grown-ups do not like to talk about. Usually, Nye had found that they fell into two categories. First, things that embarrassed or made the grown-up uncomfortable. And second, and this was the good one, things unfit for the ears of a little boy. He decided that he would have to be patient and show Mr. Ackerman that, though not entirely fond of most grown-ups, he himself was grown-up enough to be trusted, even with things unfit for the ears of a little boy. He would have to play it cool and wait until the time was right before asking again. However, it was upon arriving home from work the very next day that Mr. Ackerman found the little boy following close behind him once again. Hello, Nye, Mr. Ackerman said, and with a sigh, opened the door and beckoned for Nye to come in. Once inside, Mr. Ackerman remained silent for a time. He sat Nye down at the kitchen table clearing off from it several tools and a strange two-pronged object that he appeared to have been working on and put some water up on the kettle to boil. Pacing back and forth across the kitchen floor, Mr. Ackerman appeared to be lost in thought until at last the small kettle came to a boil and Mr. Ackerman began to speak. Do you know where clouds come from, Nye? Asked Mr. Ackerman. Sir, said Nye. Clouds, Nye, clouds, said Mr. Ackerman. Nye shook his head. Try as he might, Nye could not remember learning much of anything about clouds in school. So no one has ever told you? <laughs> 
Well, of course not. It is a secret. Mr. Ackerman cleared his throat in the manner of someone about to give a long speech. It's been said, Nye, that clouds are made up of fine droplets of water or tiny ice crystals, which are continually evaporating, while new droplets or crystals appear through the condensation of water vapor. Wow, said Nye. This, said Mr. Ackerman, is not true. Falling again to silence, Mr. Ackerman looked to Nye as though he were about to say something very important. I am going to confide in you, Nye, began Mr. Ackerman, a great secret. And the men who bear a great secret such as this, Nye, must never, never breathe a word of it to another. Not even to their grandmothers. Men have given their lives, he said, and seeing that Nye was visibly impressed, fell into a dramatic silence that Nye was sure betrayed his enormous respect for the dead. With an air of great dignity, Mr. Ackerman poured himself a cup of tea, adding to it a drop of clear liquid from his silver flask, and sat himself down at the table. But then, just as it seemed he was about to speak, something strange happened. The look on Mr. Ackerman's face changed. It was no longer one of dignity, but the look of someone who had suddenly come to his senses to find himself quite ashamed. And all at once it looked very much to Nye as though Mr. Ackerman had changed his mind and was about to say nothing at all. Please, Mr. Ackerman, please, pleaded Nye, who in all his wildest dreams had never imagined that the big factory harbored a secret so important and could contain his curiosity no more. I won't tell anyone, I promise. Mr. Ackerman glanced at the little boy and looking slightly defeated, clasped his work-worn hands. It was quite clear to him that there was little hope of shaking the boy's interest now. Okay, he said, and took in a deep, deep breath. I am a member of the secret society of cloud makers. My father was a cloud maker. My father's father was a cloud maker, and now I, too, am a cloud maker. Our clouds are distributed across the globe, Nye, made right here, and sent wherever they are needed to shade people from the angry sun. This is our secret, Nye, our secret and calling a solemn duty for which we must never, ever take credit. How come? asked Nye. How come? repeated Mr. Ackerman, searchingly. Well, you see, Nye, began Mr. Ackerman, a cloud is a powerful thing. As long as a cloud is considered a happenstance of nature, then it's a helpful and friendly thing. But should this power to create and control clouds be in the hands of all men, well, consider nations at war, I. Imagine what would happen if one nation were simply to steal all of its enemies' clouds, leaving the other's earth infertile or scorched. Or worse, fill the other's sky with thousands of cumulus clouds perpetuating a torrential downpour that need not ever end. Why, it would be the end of us all. That is why the cloud makers have always been men and women without a country, or a faith, with no allegiance at all, but to the clouds themselves. With that, Mr. Ackerman looked upwards with a gleam in his eye, as though he could see right through the kitchen ceiling, the clouds in the sky above. Our secrets are passed down from generation to generation, I. We pose always as ordinary citizens. Our factories, disguised to look no different than any of the others in their midst. Why, as far as the outside world is concerned, our factory exists solely for the production of the three-pronged one-slot widget. At this, Mr. Ackerman chuckled. 
Trucks full of the things travel to and from our factory all day. They arrive full, and so they leave. Of course, we do keep a good deal of these widgets on hand in case of a visit from the outside world. But who wants to visit the widget factory? Men and women toiling for hours on end with molten ore and soldering irons, riveting rivets until they can no longer even feel their fingertips. <sighs> no one. And if they did, they'd never be allowed past the front gate. Not without an appointment. Are all widget factories really cloud factories? Asked Nye. Mr. Ackerman shook his head. No, Nye, no. I suppose most any factory could be a cloud factory. You never know, and that's the point. No one does. That is, except for the cloud makers. And I've even heard tell of people who worked at cloud factories, who, for security reasons, hadn't even the slightest idea. How? asked Nye. By the same process usually reserved only for unexpected visitors. Atomic hypnosis. Atomic hypnosis? It's just like ordinary hypnosis, only much, much smaller. These people go to work every day, completely unaware of how entirely irreplaceable and important they are. All they see is an ordinary factory, in which they are asked to perform only the most mundane of tasks, never for a moment suspecting the incomprehensibly beautiful process in which they are taking part. Do they ever find out? No, I don't believe that most of them ever do. How come? Well, you see, Nye, atomic hypnosis is a very powerful thing. It doesn't seem fair, said the little boy, quite visibly disappointed. Fair, said Mr. Ackerman. Fair, I don't know. I am afraid, though, that it might be necessary. It's just not easy for people to believe themselves capable of such great things, Nye. It's simple insecurity. And as a matter of security, insecurity is simply not to be tolerated. A secret such as this can be put at risk for no one. You told me, said Nye, causing the flicker of shame to return to Mr. Ackerman's face once more. I... I live alone here, Nye. I haven't any children with whom to share my secrets. Mr. Ackerman poured himself another cup of tea, emptying into it more of the clear liquid from the silver flask in his front pocket. The life of a cloud maker, Nye, it's a lonely thing. To the outside world, we must purposely appear as unremarkable as possible. We lead lives designed to attract very little attention. And sometimes, Nye, sometimes we attract no attention at all. Mr. Ackerman's gaze turned down upon the kitchen table. When you grow up someday, Nye, you'll come to understand that there are some things in life that, if you don't share them, well, they can fade. Grown men have been known to disappear into thin air. Though still in the room with him, Mr. Ackerman looked to Nye to be far, far away. You're a good boy, Nye, said Mr. Ackerman, and I believe I can trust you. With that, Mr. Ackerman excused himself and withdrew to the bathroom. Nye, who had been sitting quietly and attentively for much longer than would normally be expected of a boy his age on vacation, began to wander about the house in Mr. Ackerman's absence. After all, thought Nye, I have never been in the house of a cloud maker before. In the living room, a little to the left of the front door, Nye noticed a large yellow raincoat hanging from a wooden coat rack. Whereas normally, a large yellow raincoat hanging from a wooden coat rack would be of little interest to a boy like Nye, this large yellow raincoat appeared to be covered from top to bottom in no less than a full inch of undisturbed dust. This struck Nye to be rather odd. As Nye reached out to touch the dusty coat with an outstretched finger, Mr. Ackerman stepped into the room, and with a booming voice that scared and startled Nye cried, Don't touch that! 
Now I told you, never, ever, 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 under any circumstance, may you ever so much as touch that raincoat. Do you understand? Nye backed away from the raincoat and nodded his head vigorously. This raincoat is for use only in the most severe of drought emergencies. Nye had never heard of a raincoat that was only to be used in the most severe of drought emergencies before, and was quite visibly shaken by the severity of Mr. Ackerman's tone. You didn't, didn't, stammered Nye. I didn't what? Tell me about the raincoat. I didn't. Oh, my God, I, I didn't. And there the two of them stood, neither boy nor man, knowing quite what to say. Mr. Ackerman sighed a sigh of such sadness that it made Nye shiver. I, I'm sorry, Nye. I, I shouldn't have yelled at you like that. I had no right. I was afraid you were about to... Mr. Ackerman trailed off, and with a look of embarrassment upon his face, knelt down to the height of the little boy. I'm afraid I'm, I'm just not feeling very well right now, Nye. You've been a very good boy today. You know that, don't you? Nye shook his head yes, because the way Mr. Ackerman was looking at him, he thought he ought to. I think old Mr. Ackerman needs a little rest now, he said to Nye. You won't forget what I told you here today, will you, Nye? Nye shook his head no. Okay, Nye. You go run along and play now. And so it was that Nye became the guardian of a great and profound secret. In the weeks and months that passed, Nye never looked at the big factory or the clouds above in exactly the same way again. The world seemed a new and exotic place to Nye, where new mysteries waited to be discovered around every corner. He would spend hours on the hill overlooking the big factory, watching the newborn clouds drift this way and that. In the evenings, he would sit out on his front stoop, anxiously awaiting Mr. Ackerman's return home from work. It was the complicit look that he and Mr. Ackerman would share that he looked forward to most of all. Nye felt very lucky indeed to be the bearer of such a great and important secret, and dreamed someday of becoming a cloud maker himself. Cloud making seemed so much more interesting than the other jobs he had learned about at career day in school. When asked, Mr. Ackerman just shrugged and said, Not anybody can be a cloud maker, Nye. Sure, most anyone is capable. But the title of cloud maker is something that must be earned. Right now, you're just a passenger, along for the ride. A passenger? asked Nye. This world, Nye, this world of men and women, said Mr. Ackerman, his cheeks and nose a good deal redder than Nye had ever seen them before. Little boys like you, you're nothing but passengers. Mr. Ackerman was quiet for a moment, seemingly struggling to find the right words. It's like, like a crazy carnival ride. Gone out of control, he said, his eyes widening. It's all our fault. Your fault? Asked Nye. Mr. Ackerman laughed a sad laugh. You know who built this crazy machine who's operating it? He asked. Nye shook his head. Grown-ups, Mr. Ackerman said, bowing deeply. We build the damn thing every day. Problem is, most of us don't even know it. Even though we're driving, each and every last one of us, we think we're just passengers like you, or worse, victims. We're terrible drivers, the whole lot of us. But sometimes, Nye, Sometimes, a little boy like you grows up and finds that despite everything, he can still see clearly. He finds that he can look straight ahead and steer the whole blessed thing. And when a boy can do that, he can be... A cloud maker? Asked Nye. Any damn thing he pleases, finished Mr. Ackerman. 
And I thought about how before meeting Mr. Ackerman, he had been afraid of growing up. He enjoyed how he spent his days and was yet to find a grown-up who did. Watching the grown-ups travel to and from work every day, he had witnessed looks only of boredom and stress upon their faces. Nye was always amazed by how well Mr. Ackerman was able to mimic this look of discontentment, how well he was able to mask his heroic purpose, and disappear daily into the ceaseless flow of adults who had made the whole idea of growing up look so unappealing to Nye in the first place. Mr. Ackerman was indeed so good at appearing tired and unhappy that sometimes for fleeting moments, even Nye himself was fooled. And then, early one vacation morning, Nye awoke to find something horribly wrong. Mr. Ackerman's hat and briefcase were strewn upon his front lawn, and the door to his house left hanging wide open. Through the open door, Nye could see that Mr. Ackerman's wooden coat rack had also been capsized and was laying on its side. Nye cautiously approached the house and called out to Mr. Ackerman. Mr. Ackerman, called Nye. There was no answer. Mr. Ackerman, he called yet again, poking his head through the front door. And still there was no answer. The house was completely silent. Nye, becoming more and more concerned, decided to ask his grandmother if she had heard Mr. Ackerman leaving for work that morning. Unfortunately, she had been busy splicing tape and hadn't noticed anything at all. Nye thought for a moment of asking his grandmother's help, but was afraid of compromising Mr. Ackerman's important need for secrecy. He would have to try and find Mr. Ackerman by himself for now. Nye returned to Mr. Ackerman's front yard, and gathering the hat and briefcase, cautiously entered the house. Closing the door behind him, Nye placed the hat and briefcase upon Mr. Ackerman's kitchen table and began searching about for any clues as towards Mr. Ackerman's whereabouts. Finding nothing out of the ordinary, with the exception of the capsized coat rack and raincoat, he returned once again to the briefcase. Hesitating for a moment, Nye decided that there was no other choice. The briefcase must be opened. After all, he thought, Mr. Ackerman might be in trouble. Nye gently released the latches and was quite surprised by what he found. Inside the case, a second slightly smaller case was housed, this one ice cold and made out of some sort of aluminum or other light metal. Upon this metal was etched the phrase, For authorized personnel only. Underneath this statement was etched a good deal more information. The etching was so small, however, that Nye had to press his face up against the ice-cold case and strain his eyes in order to read it. Warning, it said, for the ground transportation and containment of nimbus, stratus, cirrus, and cumulus clouds only, not to be opened in an unrefrigerated indoor environment. As Nye was straining to read the last part of this statement, his nose accidentally made contact with a small red button that he had not previously noticed. Suddenly, Nye's ears were filled with the sound of gears turning, and a mechanical whirring filled the air. The case sprung open, and out of it sprung a tiny and perfectly formed nimbus cloud. It was the most amazing thing Nye had ever seen. The little cloud drifted upwards, drifting higher and higher, until at last, it came to a rest against the cool tiles of the kitchen ceiling. Nye pulled out his chair and climbed upon the kitchen table in order to take a better look. From his new vantage point, however, it seemed as though the little cloud had not come to a rest at all, but was trying to pass through the tile ceiling in order to reach the sky above. Nye noticed also that the cloud seemed just a little bit smaller than it had been only moments ago. It was almost as if the cloud's inability to reach its proper altitude was causing it to somehow shrink. Then the words etched on the aluminum cloud case suddenly came back to him. Not to be opened in an unrefrigerated indoor environment. What will Mr. Ackerman think when he finds out that I destroyed his cloud? 
Nye was reminded of the time a bird had found its way into his grandmother's house, and the horrible panic he had felt as the bird flapped about, crashing into closed windows. He had to do something, and quickly. But the cloud was much too high and well beyond reach. How would he ever get the cloud back down and into its cloud case? Then Nye thought of Mr. Ackerman's old-fashioned refrigerator. Perhaps this could provide the sort of refrigerated environment that the cloud needed. Filling his lungs with as much air as he could muster, Nye began to blow the little cloud in the direction of Mr. Ackerman's icebox. It's working, thought Nye. It's working. Nye blew and blew until the cloud was floating just a few feet above the refrigerator door. Nye was hoping that the cloud would be drawn into the coolness of the icebox, as it would the coolness of high altitudes. However, upon opening Mr. Ackerman's refrigerator door, he found no room whatsoever for the little cloud. It seems the refrigerator was already full, not with a single grocery, mind you, but from top to bottom with clouds. Clouds of every imaginable shape and size. Stratus clouds and cirrus clouds. So many clouds, in fact, that Nye had to immediately slam the refrigerator door shut in order to keep them from pouring out. Just then, Nye felt the most amazing cool sensation on the top of his head. The truant little cloud had begun to lose altitude and was now hovering only centimeters away from his face. Nye grabbed the cloud case off the kitchen table and held it open beneath the sinking cloud. He closed the aluminum case around it and placed it directly back inside of Mr. Ackerman's briefcase, closing all the latches. This is getting me nowhere, thought Nye, who with a great sigh of relief decided to resume his search for Mr. Ackerman outside. On his way to the door, however, Nye found himself suddenly tumbling forward, falling face first to the floor. And there, beneath his feet, lay the culprit, the infamous large yellow raincoat with its inch of undisturbed dust. Retrieving the raincoat and straightening the coat rack from which it had fallen, Nye heard the unmistakable sound of distant thunder. Oh, no, he thought. Rain would be of no help at all. Nye poked his head outside to find that indeed it had begun raining and soon it became quite apparent that this was no ordinary rainstorm. With each passing moment, the rain fell harder and the wind blew stronger until what had begun as a pleasant sprinkle had become no less than a torrential downpour. In his mission, however, Nye would not be discouraged. Mr. Ackerman might be in trouble and if this was the case, it would be with the bravery and strength of the most grown-up of grown-ups anywhere that Nye would strive to find him. And so out into the storm Nye went, protected only by an ill-fitting large yellow raincoat that he now wore. All around Nye, the skies grew darker and darker until not the tiniest trace of sunlight remained. Huge tornadoes began to gather upon the horizons, their deafening winds so loud that Nye was unable to hear the sound of his grandmother calling for him to come home. Spiraling raindrops filled the air, turning the earth to mud and flooding the streets all about him. And then suddenly, a tremendous gust of wind came along, blowing Nye off his feet and blowing the open raincoat right off of him. Nye looked up from his seat in a puddle and was astonished by what he saw. The moment the raincoat had blown off of him, the rain had stopped and the sun came out. There were chirping birds and all shone with the warm glow of a clear sky as the powerful cumulus clouds that had been pounding the earth with its torrential downpour just a moment ago had all but withdrawn. Nye looked at the raincoat which was now strewn on the ground a few feet in front of him and looked back up at the sky. He got up, went to retrieve the raincoat, but as soon as he touched it, he found the sky darkening and the distant sound of thunder again returning. He took his hand off the raincoat, 
and found that the sun had once again come out. He repeated this several times and found that every time his hand made contact with the coat, the cumulus clouds were once again drawn to fill the sky and the moment he released the coat, the clouds withdrew. This was another of Mr. Ackerman's possessions, Nye decided, that should only be touched by trained and authorized personnel. He reached for a small branch that in the storm had been blown off of a nearby tree, and with it lifted the raincoat carefully and returned it to Mr. Ackerman's wooden coat rack. Then a thought occurred to Nye. What if early that morning there had been some sort of emergency at the cloud factory, one that required Mr. Ackerman's immediate attention? An emergency of such great importance that he was unable to pause for a moment, not even to close the front door or retrieve the fallen hat and briefcase that he had dropped in his haste. If such had been the case, then Mr. Ackerman would certainly appreciate having his hat and briefcase brought to him. Certainly he would, thought Nye. And so, Nye climbed to the top of the big hill, Mr. Ackerman's hat and briefcase in hand and looked down at the great factory as he had done so many times before. He knew he'd never get past the guards at the front gate. At best, they would simply take the hat and briefcase from him and then send him on his way. Now I wanted to see that Mr. Ackerman was all right with his own two eyes and to see inside the cloud factory more than almost anything in the whole wide world. He had discovered some time ago that around the back of the factory, there was a small hole at the base of the barbed wire fence, just the right size for a skinny nine-year-old boy to fit through. Nye made his way carefully down the hill so as not to slip on the wet grass and climbed quietly through the hole, pulling the hat and briefcase behind him. The factory consisted of two tall silver buildings, one rectangle and one square, connected at the center by another giant bubble-shaped building roughly double the size of the others. The whole of the structure was covered from top to bottom in long lines of blinking lights and lighted windows. It looked to Nye like a giant version of the old recording equipment that his grandmother kept in their basement. Looking up at the smokestacks, Nye wondered if he had ever seen anything quite so tall. Standing right up next to them for the first time, he had certainly never felt smaller. Just then, Nye heard the sound of voices and footsteps coming from somewhere nearby. He looked around for some place to hide, but could see none. Moving along the back of the great structure, he came to a single unmarked door and gave its knob a try. The door was unlocked, and Nye, hearing the voices and footsteps draw nearer, slowly and quietly cracked the door open and stepped inside. What Nye saw then was at once the most amazing and beautiful thing he had ever seen in his life. Rows of singing white-haired women sitting on a vast and spiraling assembly line. In front of each, a small and perfectly formed cloud floating only inches above a frost-covered silver tray. Men cranking cranks and pulling levers upon huge machines made of silver and bronze Hundreds of workers suspended in midair by string, pulleys, and wire, pedaling upon small contraptions whose pedals and gears were linked to bigger gears, and those to bigger gears, and those to bigger gears yet. Above them, giant fans blowing the larger completed clouds toward smokestacks high along the factory's vast lighted ceiling, creating huge cloud-shaped shadows that drifted over the men and women working a hundred feet below. He saw several raised platforms upon which sat workers surrounded by huge control panels of blinking and flashing lights, buttons and knobs of every imaginable size and color, frost-covered golden tubs housing hundreds of tiny floating clocks waiting for inspection. Suspended from the ceiling, a giant clock of a sort that he had never seen before, flanked on all sides by a towering bank of gauges and meters, and rising out of it all, on the tallest platform yet, he saw the elder Cloudmaker, who from his perch high above, directed the flow of the entire factory, 
with graceful waves of his left hand while calling out through the megaphone in his right. Nimbus, 200 of 3,000. Stratus, 44 of 53. Cumulus, 27 of 413. And on and on. Now I realized that he had begun to shiver and noticed also that he could see his breath. Looking around at the singing silver-haired women seated all about him, now I noticed that their breath could be seen as well. In fact, upon closer inspection, it almost looked as if the women were singing the clouds before them. Putting on Mr. Ackerman's large hat and crossing his arms against the chill, Nye proceeded to look about the building for any sign of Mr. Ackerman. He noticed that every single chair in the building seemed to be filled, with the exception of one, and that this one empty chair seemed to be the focus of many an anxious glance by the workers in its midst. Even the elder cloudmaker, directing the whole factory from his platform high above, was seen to glance worriedly at this empty chair from time to time. Indeed, this chair located high atop the only empty examination platform seemed to be a matter of great concern to all the cloud makers. Crawling his way along the factory's back wall so as not to be noticed, Nye made his way slowly but surely to the platform in question. He waited silently until he was sure no one was looking and climbed slowly up to the platform's top. Peeking over the edge, Nye could clearly see a silver plaque bolted to the back of the empty chair. And etched upon this silver plaque, he could clearly see was the name R.A. Ackerman. Nye suddenly became quite aware that every sound in the factory had ceased and had been replaced with a shocked and deadly silence. Looking up, he saw that all work in the factory had come to a stop and that every last eye in the vast building was upon him. A little boy, boomed the elder cloudmaker, who in his shock did not realize that he was still speaking through the megaphone. Several of the cloudmakers began slowly to rise to their feet, and Nye, now aware that he might be in terrible trouble, collected the briefcase and ran as fast as he could towards the door through which he had entered. Finding the door still unlocked, Nye made a hasty exit, not looking back even once outside. Hearing a growing commotion behind him, he made his way to the gate and squeezed himself back to the small hole. Once through, he ran as fast as he could up the hill and to the road just beyond it. At just that moment, a fire engine with its lights flashing slowly turned the corner and began sounding its alarm, having just pulled out of the engine house. The firemen on board were under the luring influence of the fire siren and did not notice the small boy as he climbed on board. Nye hid himself underneath one of the fire engine's big benches and exhausted by the day's adventures, drifted off to sleep. He awoke a good time later to find a wet and motley group of firemen looking down at him. Don't you know that fire engines are dangerous places for little boys? asked a fireman with a kind face. You could have been hurt. What's your name? Nye, said Nye. You mustn't ever go near a fire engine when it's in use, Nye. Now, if you were to come by the engine house some afternoon, that'd be a different story. Why, me and the boys, we'd even give you a tour. But when we're fighting a fire, that's business only for a trained firefighter. And even trained firefighters die fighting fires. Do you understand, Nye? Nye nodded yes, and the fireman smiled. Someday, Nye, you might even grow up to be a real fireman, just like us. Though he tried not to show it, Nye shuddered inwardly at the thought of being forever subject to the whims of the fire siren. Where do you live, Nye? the fireman asked. Nye looked up to see where he was and saw in the afternoon light that the truck had traveled rather far from Telegraph Road. However, not wanting to answer too many more questions about his day's activities, Nye pointed to a spot vaguely down the block. 
Well, you head on home now, Nye. Relieved, Nye stepped down from the fire truck. Oh, and Nye, where did you get the hat and briefcase from? They're, they're my father's, said Nye. The fireman smiled, and with that the engine was off, leaving Nye standing alone on a street corner. Realizing that he had a very long walk ahead of him, Nye started for home. As he walked, he reflected upon the day's events and became more and more concerned that something horrible really had become of Mr. Ackerman. Soon the day began to turn slowly into night, and Nye noticed that though he had been walking for quite some time in the direction of home, things were looking less and less familiar, until soon they were no longer familiar at all. Nye realized that he was lost, and in a part of town that he had never been to before. The buildings loomed larger, and somehow grayer, with dark alleys that spread like vast spider webs between them. There were more and more grown-ups everywhere, all rushing to and fro, with haste and impatience. Nye was becoming worried that he might never find his way home. He had walked a long, long way, and his legs were aching as it was. He knew one thing for sure. He was tired, and did not much like this new part of town in which he had found himself. Nye sat down on a curb to rest his legs for a moment, and was almost tripped over by a large businessman who had been rushing past. Watch where you're sitting, little boy, scolded the cross businessman, who dusted himself off and continued on his way. Not wanting to be tripped over again, Nye gathered himself up and entered one of the nearby alleys. At least here there would be less traffic and he could rest. The alley was dark and Nye, moving carefully so as not to bump into anything, settled against the wall of the building, finding a nice soft spot on which to rest his head. It was now almost completely dark and as night settled on this strange part of the city, Nye found the sounds coming from outside of the alley to be more violent and foreboding. Drunken sounds, bottles smashing, and men fighting. Wild laughter that offered not a hint of happiness. Nye wished more than anything to be safe and at home with Grandma. He realized that he was hungry and that Grandma had probably had his dinner ready long ago. He knew also that once the dinner time had come and passed, she would have begun to worry. Nye promised himself that he would take only a short rest and then immediately continue on his journey home. And it was with this conviction that Nye's already heavy eyelids became altogether too heavy to lift at all. And Nye fell once again into the deepest and most pleasant of sleeps. What Nye did not know as he drifted off to the land of dreams was that the soft object he had come to rest against was not a bundle of rags, nor a waste paper bag. In fact, it was not an object at all. It was a man. A very tired and sleeping man by the name of Rudolph Abacus Ackerman. In a matter of moments now, Nye and his friend Mr. Ackerman will awaken and discover each other in the morning light. But let us first take a moment to discover for ourselves the difference between the sound of a sunrise on Telegraph Road, as we experienced at the beginning of our adventure, and the sound of a sunrise on the streets of a sleepless city, as the first rays of morning light glitter peacefully upon the empty silver flask in Mr. Ackerman's outstretched hand. Nye, said Mr. Ackerman. Mr. Ackerman, said Nye, who rubbed his eyes, for a moment not quite sure at all of where he was. 
Mr. Ackerman, you're all right. You're all right, he cried. Cringing at the volume of the excited boy's voice, Mr. Ackerman squinted at Nye. I'm fine, Nye, fine. What, what are you doing here? I was looking for you, said Nye. Looking for me, repeated Mr. Ackerman. Does your grandmother know you're here? Nye shook his head. Oh, Nye, said Mr. Ackerman. She must be so worried. Watching Mr. Ackerman squint, it occurred to Nye that the early morning sun was hurting the cloudmaker's eyes. He carefully retrieved Mr. Ackerman's hat and handed it to him. Mr. Ackerman thanked Nye, but did not put it on, instead returning it to the ground where it had been. How in the world did you find me, Nye? He asked. Excitedly, Nye began to recount the previous day's events. As Nye spoke, the look of sadness that had taken hold of Mr. Ackerman's face began to deepen, and from time to time, he simply shook his head. Finally seeming as though he could listen to no more, Mr. Ackerman righted himself and silenced Nye with a wave of his swollen right hand. Please, Nye, please, he said, seemingly quite lost in thought. There passed a moment of silence between the two. The excitement Nye had felt in recounting his story quickly faded and was replaced instead with a creeping feeling of dread. Mr. Ackerman was right. His grandmother was surely sick with worry, and with his previous day's adventures, Mr. Ackerman seemed none too pleased. In fact, looking at Mr. Ackerman just then, it seemed that he too might be sick, though maybe not with worry. Nye felt the question he had been dying to ask since he awoke bubbling up. What happened to you, Mr. Ackerman? Mr. Ackerman looked at Nye, and for a moment appeared to be at a loss for an answer. Nye watched as Mr. Ackerman's gaze first fell upon his shoes, and then to the ground beneath them. Nothing happened to me, Nye, Mr. Ackerman said finally. Nothing happens to me. The boy looked up at him expectantly, waiting. I just left. Mr. Ackerman looked at Nye. I got fed up and left. You'll understand when you grow up. But the cloud makers, they need you. Mr. Ackerman looked down at the little boy before him and shook his head. We've got to get you home now, was all Mr. Ackerman said. But Nye did not follow. He stood in place and looked up at Mr. Ackerman, clearly not understanding. Seeing this, Mr. Ackerman looked suddenly quite ashamed and stopped. He turned back towards Nye and feeling for the flask in his jacket pocket, quietly spoke. I, Mr. Ackerman said, am not a cloud maker. At this, Nye found his head swimming, and a great sob escaped from somewhere deep within him. After all the strange and scary things he had experienced in the past 24 hours, it seemed he had found himself at last beginning to cry. Nye could not understand why, after all he had done, Mr. Ackerman would no longer trust him with his secret. And it was the thought that he had somehow lost this trust that he could not bear. His face red with shame, Mr. Ackerman took the crying boy into his arms, and had Nye's face not been buried in the lining of his jacket, Nye would have noticed that at that moment Mr. Ackerman looked very, very old. Mr. Ackerman felt very much as if he should say something, but was at a bit of a loss as to what that something should be. There are cloud makers, he offered, and the boy looked up. I believe with all my heart that there are cloud makers. Why, just look up at the sky, he said, pointing upwards. What more proof could you need? As Nye's tears began to abate, Mr. Ackerman put a firm hand on the boy's shoulder and knelt down so as to look him directly in the eye. It's just that I, 
he said. Rudolf Abacus Ackerman. I'm not one of them. I'm a widget maker. That factory, Nye, it's a widget factory. That's all it's ever been. We make widgets there. Three-pronged, one-slot widgets. I didn't want to tell you, Nye. I didn't want to tell you because I'm not proud of it. I don't even like widgets. Looking down at Nye, Mr. Ackerman suddenly realized that the boy did not believe him. Look at my hands, Nye. They're worn. They swell up. It's from years of curing widgets, riveting rivets into slots, and molding metal prongs. There's no place in a cloud factory for a man like me. But Mr. Ackerman, I saw the cloud factory, pleaded Nye. There are no clouds in that factory, boomed Mr. Ackerman, who, surprised by the volume of his own voice, cringed and continued in a much quieter and apologetic tone. I wish there were, Nye. I wish to the heavens above that it were one of those factories. But in that factory, Nye, there's nothing at all but widgets. And that is why I must stay here and seek to once again fill my silver flask. And you, Nye, must be sent home to your grandmother this instant. But Mr. Ackerman, sobbed Nye. And then suddenly, Nye had an idea. He crawled over to Mr. Ackerman's briefcase and opened both it and the cold silver case within. What Mr. Ackerman saw then, he would remember for the rest of his life. A small, perfectly formed nimbus cloud, drifting slowly skyward out of the open recess of his briefcase. Mr. Ackerman stood up, and with his mouth hanging open, and a look of shock upon his face, moved towards the small cloud in order to examine it more closely. The cloud, however, continued to drift upwards and away from him. Not for a moment taking his eyes away from the rising cloud, Mr. Ackerman continued in its pursuit, and Nye, taking Mr. Ackerman's hand, gently placed Mr. Ackerman's hat back upon his head, where it belonged. The two followed their cloud out of the narrow alleyway and down to the busy city street, where the busy city dwellers were far too busy to notice the spectacle of a nine-year-old boy and a disheveled man marching hand in hand behind a small nimbus cloud. The further along they went in pursuit of the cloud, the higher also it drifted. Mr. Ackerman never for a moment took his gaze away from the cloud, like a man hypnotized. And when Nye finally did, he found that things were once again beginning to look familiar. The cloud, it seemed, was leading them home. The boy and the man, hand in hand, followed the cloud from street to street, over grassy fields, steep hills, and deepened valleys until the cloud had reached such an elevation that it was no longer distinguishable from the other clouds that filled the sky around it. It was at this point that Mr. Ackerman looked downwards from the sky and found himself at the gate of the great factory. The guard at the gate smiled warmly and beckoned for both Nye and Mr. Ackerman to come in. But Mr. Ackerman hesitated. He was no longer sure of what awaited him and the little boy inside, and was suddenly quite afraid. I'm just an ordinary man, he said backing away. The guard put a reassuring hand on Mr. Ackerman's shoulder and led him through the open factory gate. Now flanked on either side by the guard and the little boy who was still holding his hand, Mr. Ackerman began to walk tentatively forward and the awkward threesome soon made their way to the huge double doors that marked the factory's entrance. Sweating profusely, Mr. Ackerman took a deep breath, and before he could protest, watched as the guard unlatched the giant latch and pushed the huge factory doors wide open. What 
what Mr. Rudolph Abacus Ackerman saw then was at once the most amazing and beautiful thing that he had ever seen. Rows of singing white-haired women sitting on a vast and spiraling assembly line. In front of each, a small and perfectly formed cloud floating only inches above a frost-covered silver tray. Men cranking cranks and pulling levers upon huge machines made of silver and bronze. Hundreds of workers suspended in midair by string, pulleys, and wire, pedaling upon small contraptions whose pedals and gears were linked to bigger gears, and those to bigger gears, and those to bigger gears yet. Above them, giant fans blowing the larger completed clouds toward smokestacks high along the factory's vast lighted ceiling, creating huge cloud-shaped shadows that drifted over the men and women working a hundred feet below. He saw several raised platforms upon which sat workers surrounded by huge control panels of blinking and flashing lights, buttons and knobs of every imaginable size and color, frost-covered golden tubs housing hundreds of tiny floating clocks waiting for inspection. Suspended from the ceiling, a giant clock of a sort that he had never seen before, flanked on all sides by a towering bank of gauges and meters. And rising out of it all, on the tallest platform yet, he saw the elder Cloudmaker, who from his perch high above, directed the flow of the entire factory with graceful waves of his left hand while calling out through the megaphone in his right. Nimbus, 200 of 3,000. Stratus, 44 of 53. Cumulus, 27 of 413. And on and on. Nigh tugging at his sleeve, Mr. Ackerman entered the cloud factory, and the whole of the cloud makers, in their hundreds, turned to face him. On his platform high above, the elder cloud maker stopped conducting for a moment and smiled. They took Mr. Ackerman's jacket and hat and led him up the very steps of the platform that Nye had visited the day before and so delivered him to the chair upon which his name was engraved. As the look of astonishment on Mr. Ackerman's face began slowly to turn to a smile, I realized that he had never truly seen Mr. Ackerman smile before. And now, as his misty eyes gratefully surveyed the hundreds of cloud makers in his midst, Nye saw a single drop of moisture fall upon Mr. Ackerman's cheek. Now whether this was a drop of precipitation from one of the great clouds above, or a single tear of his own, he could hardly guess as Rudolph Abacus Ackerman smiled the biggest smile that Nye had ever seen and began silently to work.